or not? So, who started the recording? I thought only I could do that. We started it from the meeting room. Okay, that's great. To make sure you didn't forget. Thank you. So, FYI, recording is on, everyone. Yep. <clears throat> so, usual introduction slides. If you don't know what the patent policy is and uh, the rules for substantive contributions, you better you better learn learn quick. And we have a schedule. We put dates on every meeting until uh, until June. So if we have something to change, something that we can can change if we need to. Much easier to take one and uh, and change it than than to say, oh, when will we are we having the next one? So that's uh, good to know. Make a note, and if something that is is completely bogus, then we'll just have to have to change it. Anyway, we need a scribe as usual. I'll take care of it. Great. So. The recording will be public. So, WTC Code of Conduct, please be nice, be professional. Virtual meeting, interim meeting tips, you still have, you, you still see them. And now we're, we're going to try, the, try to use the hand icon, this one, to to make a queue, and uh, if there are people on the queue, then we definitely serve the, this reserve the right to mute people who are speaking out of turn, because we really want to have the opportunity for more people to to say to to be heard. And. Uh, can we see the queue somewhere? Uh, uh, once you once you have uh, this one up, you're supposed to be you're supposed to have an icon somewhere that uh, uh, that lists all the people who have the queue. And the, the queue. list of participants. Yep, it's top of the participant list. So now everyone opens the participant list. So. Repeat document status, all that. All that. Uh, let me see. We have two call for consensus running. We have support from for a low latency streaming use case from everyone who's taken a position and and one abstain. And we have a. So we can we can probably say that we have cons we have consensus to adopt the low latency streaming use case on the face detection API. I have one objection, which is Bernard, who isn't here. That's the problem. So uh, we'll have to review that and and come back. I think that for. Uh... At least the first uh, low latency streaming use cases. There are some issues, so we probably need to uh, resolve the issues, and then there will be consensus. Well, I think uh, well, uh, abstain doesn't count as uh, counting against consensus. So I think that based on the current uh, results on call call for consensus, we can merge and and iterate. I think it's it's already merged. It's just that the, the warning there's no consensus. I guess yeah. uh, I yeah. would prefer that we remove it once we have uh, resolved the issues. And uh, can you can you state that uh, state state that on an other mailing list that sure. you're not abstaining, you're objecting? Oh, okay, <laughs> okay. Then uh, I'll change this then. Yeah. Oh, uh, the rule for 
the usual rule for call for consensus is that if we don't have objections, we have definitely have consensus, and abstain doesn't count for um, as an objection. And so we'll uh, look at the issue that is raised on face detection and see if that's easily solvable. There will be more call for, calls for consensus soon. And Bernard's been running those, but uh, we'll have more. Because uh, get, getting, all, getting those markers removed should actually mean something. So, long list of issues today, and we're currently one minute over time behind, so we will usually hurry up. And uh, we're starting off with uh, Fippo and Janivar, who have things to say about uh, issues on WebRTC PC. You have 20 minutes. Fippo, are you here? If Fippo is not here for the first one, I can probably uh, say a few words. And then uh, we can start from there. Yep. Let's do that. So I I, I don't remember this, the exact slide for issue 2795, but we, we decided to remove the URL in the uh, um, peer connection ice event uh, object. Uh, and from that, there, there's, one, there's one thing that is broken currently in the WebRTC spec, which is that uh, peer connection i7 in it, the dictionary to create uh, the event, has a, con a candidate field and an URL field. So the URL field is probably useless, and we should probably remove it. And if, if algorithms are actually using it, then we, we need to update uh, the algorithms. So that, that's the first thing. And um, the second thing is that uh, usually we are able to, to shim properly uh, events. And RTC is candidate currently. You cannot create it. You, uh, when you call the constructor, you cannot uh, create an ICE candidate with uh, an URL value that is not undefined. And the question is, uh, are we good with that? Or do we want to allow uh, web application to create RTC ICE candidate with uh, URL values? Meaning that, uh, meaning that, for instance, they could shim uh, properly uh, peer connection ICE events uh, with candidates that have URLs, for instance. Or they could shim uh, over like the, the pair of candidates with one having URL and the other not having an URL, and so on. So that, that's, the, that's the question there. Uh, so the two questions. Uh, first one on the ICE event init. Hopefully, everybody will agree that we should remove it. And the next one on uh, the ICE candidate constructor. Uh, do we want to uh, allow setting the URL uh, parameter of the ICE candidate for the constructor? Thoughts? Oh, first, first thank you. Uh, the, the reason why uh, the URL is uh, useful at all is because it allows you to identify which candidates come from which servers uh, and uh, not being able to and having a constructor that is not able to create all values that's a problem for testing so uh, i would like i would like to see that uh, that RTC ICE candidate in it can take a new URL, so that uh, so that you can uh, can generate those candidates. Janiver. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so I don't have a strong opinion on this. Just a comment that um, the lack of a constructor argument does not prevent JavaScript from adding attributes. Or modifying attributes, as far as I know, is that true on an interface? Wait. Yeah, you you, you can add a uh, you can probably add, can add uh, getter and update it, but it, it's not the same code path. So you will have mm. edge cases where things will not work properly. 
okay. or will not work as expected. All right, I don't have a strong opinion then. Thanks. So add ice, add ice candidate, take some RTC ice candidate in it. Um, and the ice candidate, RTC ice candidate interface specifies all its attributes as read only. Hmm. So no, you can't update the URL. Uh, Henry? Yeah, uh, no strong opinion for me either. I just think strange that you can construct everything except one of these things. But I don't like. Uh, I think you could probably work around it, uh, like Janivar suggested. So no strong opinion either. Okay, uh, it's it's a small issue, so maybe we yes, we can now. decide quickly. I, I I guess nobody is like uh, very strong minded either way. So what what's the resolution then? Uh, there's my there's a mild preference to add it. That's my understanding, and there's consensus that we can remove uh, the earl from uh, IC event in it. Yes, I don't. I haven't heard an argument against that now. Anywhere? So, would this mean that um, if an ice candidate that's uh, JSON stringified would include the URL? No, we we have decided that we would not do that. So, no, we have not okay. decided that we don't would, no, don't oh. want to do that. Because that uh, is the round trip argument. Uh, okay, so, so but that's another issue we should discuss. Then I, I thought we, we we agreed we had consensus in the past meeting that we would not add it. But yeah, okay, that's an that's another issue, I guess. It's a separate issue. Well, they're, they're linked, I think, because um, if you create a nice candidate with a URL, and then you JSONify it, you would expect to get the nice candidate in it, and also we we. Uh, we, we, we we can create two dictionaries then. Maybe RTCI also, candidate in it could be, uh, right. but two JSON could be RTCI candidate JSON, you know, something like that, for instance. And also, uh, RTCI candidate in it is the argument to add ICE candidate. We should also consider whether it's uh, what it would mean for ICE candidate to look at the URL field, if that, excuse me, is a um, concern here. So we, we don't yet have consensus. That's the conclusion here. We should move on since we're short of time. Next next uh, next issue. 20, 20, oh, I'm, I got the button. Duplicate reads. Janivar, this is yours, I think. Yeah, so. Um... We can actually skip these because these were merged. Good. Um, so the, the slides were from an earlier slide deck, uh, and people are welcome to look over and see if they uh, disagree with them. But the changes were small enough, and there were no really objections on GitHub. So we went ahead and removed uh, duplicate reads in proposed send encodings. And similarly, uh, in create answers encodings, there's a PR to um, do the necessary work to uh, defer pruning of send encodings to the answer. Uh, previous uh, PR had some mistakes in it uh, that are fixed by this PR. Uh, next slide. And some more updates here. And uh, that's it. So we're back on track. We're actually 10 minutes ahead. So Bernard, uh, since you're here, can, do you want to take over? Uh, sure. Uh, well, uh, why don't we go to the next section since I think I'll be talking for a little bit of it and then we can switch. Yep, let's go on. 
Remember to see extensions. Okay, so we have a couple of issues here. Why don't you go to the next slide and I'll introduce it. So uh, first one is issue 40, 43. We've discussed this before uh, at the July 2020 WebRTC Working Group meeting. Uh, and basically we had a resolution that Florent was to submit a PR and we now are developing PR 139. So let me introduce this. The basic use case is a situation where uh, you want to do mixed codec simulcast and that would be a situation, for example, where you want to use AB1 but you're only going to get a decent performance at the low resolution. Say you might have some hardware uh, acceleration but it can't go to the largest resolution or uh, for example, on a mobile device, AV1 will just suck too much power and create too much heat at the higher resolutions. So basically, you'd want to send AV1 at low res and then something else at higher res, VP8, VP9, and H264, whatever. Um, so, uh, and, and actually doing this with formal simulcast uh, has the following advantages. You don't require multiple senders, so you're not creating an AV1 stream um, and then, for example, simulcast with VP8 or VP9, you're doing it in a unified way. That gives you uh, unified resource allocation and some graceful degradation between the layers, um, which multiple senders wouldn't do. Um, the other thing is that if you're doing it with simulcast, you're com potentially compatible with a transceiver we'll describe uh, uh, why. And then you can also potentially switch the codecs without offer answer as long as the codecs you have are within the uh, we're selected by our friends. Okay, so that's a little bit of background. Basically, we've uh, discussed this issue before, um, and now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the approach, which was previewed uh, previously. Next slide. Okay, so uh, in looking at this, we looked at what ORTC did, which is they basically put the payload type in the RTP coding parameters. However, this doesn't work with WebRTC because the payload types aren't negotiated yet. So you can't call us with a transceiver because you don't know the payload type yet. It's negotiated in the offer answer. So uh, the alternative, which we had discussed previously and which we're uh, pursuing in PR 139, is to put the RTP codec capability into the encoding parameters instead. So that's how we describe the codec, not through the payload type, which we don't know, uh, but through the uh, codec capability, which we do know. Um, and so a couple of constraints here, uh, as we said, we don't know the payload type yet, so you, you, you can't use that. Uh, but also the codec you select has to be one of the ones that's in get capabilities. Uh, uh, because if it's not, then it's, it's not one of the potential codecs that you could have. Um, next slide. So uh, so this is an example of how it would work. For example, if you called uh, uh, used air transceiver with the following send encodings, uh, what you would get is a quarter resolution potentially uh, at, uh, well, you, you put two codecs in here actually in, in this particular example. Uh, one is AV1 and one is VP8. Uh, and then at the uh, full resolution, you would have only VP8. Um, and I, I put in the uh, dictionary from the coder capability from Weber to CPC uh, because it shows you that uh, the MIME type and the clock type are required. You could also put in the channels and the SM, SF, SDP FMPP line uh, if that was needed to differentiate, which it would be, I guess, with H264. Um, but that's basically, uh, this is basically what we're, what we're talking about. Um, next slide. Okay, so, yeah, so I'll let uh, Florent uh, take it from here. So that was basically 43, we're trying to construct the PR. There's also 126, which extends uh, issue 43 a bit. Go ahead, Florent. Right, thank you, Bernard. Uh, so in issue 126 that Henry created, we want to address a uh, primary you know, a problem, but that the API proposed would also cover the use case for a uh, mixed codec simulcast. So the problem that we have is that uh, we have some applications that want to be able to select which codec is used, but we don't want to do that by doing a renegotiation to uh, put the codec uh, they want to use first in the list. 
this is a very clunky mechanism that requires many different calls. Um, set collect preferences, then doing all the steps for uh, the negotiation, and then finally updating um, the scalability mode. Uh, because if you change codec, you probably want a different scalability mode. So that is a very, very annoying mechanism. And uh, we think it's really prone to um, a lot of issues uh, because we will probably have people trying to renegotiate while doing these changing different parameters. It's not really good to do it uh, with so many steps. Uh, next slide, please. So, in order to address that, we think that we could probably have a single call to a set parameters that is able to change the codec that is used and possibly the scalability mode for uh, changing the SVC, the SVC mode that is used. And uh, so, I put some examples uh, of how it could be used. Uh, basically, you set the codec um, value on RTC RTP codec uh, capability uh, on RTC RTP coding parameters, which is a type RT, RTC RTP codec capability. It's a, a single value in the PR. In the old version, it was an array. Uh, that's something that we can discuss later. Um, we set a codec and then we set some scalability mode. We call set parameters, and yes, we change everything as you would think it would work. Um, you could also use it uh, through a transceiver uh, by setting the sign encodings um, parameters uh, from the init um, init uh, tran uh, the tra init transceiver um, dictionary, and then you would say, um, I have. Um, uh, first layer that is a quarter that is AV1, and I have a full layer that is VP8. Those are simple examples um, of how it could be used. And you could would be able to do that during a call and change which uh, encoders are used on all the layers uh, very simply. Uh, next slide, please. So there's a few things that might want that we might want to define what happens what happens when you renegotiate for example um if you select uh, av1 and you renegotiate even for the other api we wanted to avoid that but it may still happen what should happen if av1 which was the select codec is no longer available um should you have an error in set local description or set remote description should you remove the codec value and use the first negotiated codec? It might be um, the logical choice there. Uh, also, should we have a single value for the codec or should we have an array as was presented uh, a few years ago? Um, if we have a single value or multiple values, it doesn't really help with a problem that is choosing the scalability mode that is matching the codec that is used, um, which some people have raised as an issue, um, as a problem in the issue 126. Um, I think that a single value is probably enough. Maybe having um, an array would be preferred by users. And then we pick the first value that is available in the array. And uh, is the question also that I want to ask is renegotiation, is it a problem for people who want to use this API? Maybe they will just negotiate once against an SFU that is able to handle every codec. And then if you need to switch to a different codec because someone enters a call with um, low power device and they only can use VP8, maybe you can just use uh, that new API to switch to VP8 talk to your SFU and the SFU will only forward VP8 to the members of the call that only support it. And then you don't really have a problem and you basically never need to renegotiate um, a, tran a transceiver. You might still want to do it to add new transceivers if other people join the call, but you don't 
necessarily need to do that to uh, change the capabilities, basically. So those are some questions uh, that I have, uh, and I think that we can probably talk about it uh, for a few minutes, if you want. And there are some people who raise their hand, and the first one would be Bernard. Uh, hi, Florence. Yeah, so um, I have some questions about some weird uh, cases that I have seen in the field. Um, one of them is a situation where you have a hardware encoder, but somehow the resources get grabbed out from under you, and now you have a software encoder that's not giving you the performance you want. Um, would it help? Uh, so that's a weird situation where, say, you put in you would put in a single value, and now the whole point of doing it is is lost because your AV1, for example, uh, you're trying to do it in software on a mobile device, and the performance is terrible. Um, it does uh, are, are there situations where, particularly for the edge transceiver case, where you think that having the array would make sense? Uh, and in the case I just described, I guess you're kind of uh, in a pickle no matter what. So I don't think it matters, right, if you have one or, or more than one. Uh, right. Um, so for um, the problem with hardware encoders that have limited uh, uh, capacity, um, so if you didn't have a software fallback, set parameters should actually throw an error uh, when you are not able to acquire the hardware resources. So yeah, that would be that, initially. If it happened later, it wouldn't, right? If it happens later, we don't handle errors in WebRTC, and I believe that Henrik has a proposal right, so that's that would be able problem. to cover those use cases. Uh, but otherwise, if you have a software fallback, it's really hard to have um, behavior that is always good because if you run out of uh, capacity on your hardware encoder, you might just use a software fallback. And we don't have a control that uh, allows you to only use the hardware encoder and then trigger those errors that we mentioned if um, that's what we wanted. So, yeah, so I guess with Henrik's 127 issue, I guess to solve this, what you'd need is some indication that basically I've run out of resources. So then you'd call set parameters again and try to fix it. Okay. Yes, yeah, so we could probably have some of the signals, but I think that is orthogonal to this issue. Okay. Thank you. And um, next in line would be Harold. Yep. So just uh, stating opinions. I think the renegotiation problem is pretty easily solved if, if we just say that when you set uh, uh, when you set the encoding, it must be valid, and when you negotiate, even for the first negotiation, removed and you remove anything from the internal slot holding the capabilities that isn't in the negotiated codex. And you do that for the renegotiation too. And uh, then we should say that uh, for ease of use, we should have an array, and we should use the first entry in the entry in the array that's still there after negotiation. And if the array is empty, just do something else. I think that's a rule that is possible to specify, and possible to code, and possible to understand, which is probably good. Okay. Thank you, Henrik. Uh, yes. So I, I have a I have slides. I'm not, I'm not going to go into it now, but but it's somewhat overlaps with this, and it's it's somewhat uh, a separate issue, but uh, which we'll talk about later. But regardless of that, I do have a preference for having uh, in the set parameters called a single codec value, because I think that. Um, so my opinion is that there should either be a um, sensible default um, or that we should disable the stream because there when you introduce scalability mode you get into these combinations and there's different trade-offs uh, you might have different number of layers for example so i would keep this api surface as as simple as possible i guess it could be possible to if the codec doesn't match uh, the codec selected doesn't match that using some of the mechanisms that you propose uh, in 
uh, next slide, uh, that we throw an error and that the application handles it and reconfigures. Um, Yaniva? Uh, yes, so, uh, apologies if I don't, haven't followed this um, too deeply, but I, I know that in the API so far, we've, we've tried very hard to not have set parameters and the negotiation methods control the same properties whether it be active or scale resolution down by because that creates inherent application races between set remote description and local JavaScript access methods like set parameters. So it's possible that what Harl said just uh, solved that, uh, but I'm not positive. I think that the negotiation is just about which codecs are allowed in the transceiver and not necessarily which one is used. And so those are different but related problems. And this API would allow you not to pick the first one in the list, but any codec in the list. And it's a little bit different. So the usage is not the same. Right at the moment, people use renegotiation as a way to force the first codec in the list so that it is the one used. But I think we need more control, which is what this is addressing. Uh, thank you for the feedback. Uh, Bernard, you are again. Yeah, uh, just one comment. I, I think um, there may be a difference in how things would work uh, before and after offer answer. So after offer answer, you have uh, selected the potentially used codex. And I think at that point, uh, in set parameters, you, you really only have uh, you, you, the, the codex in the list have to be within that envelope. Um, so you check them against that, not against set capabilities. Um, as to whether there's just uh, one of them or two of them, I think after offer answer, you could probably just have one. Uh, although to be clear, that uh, the one you choose doesn't affect create offer or anything like that. So there's no overlap, overlap with set coded preferences. It's just taking choosing which one of the one in the envelope uh, is, is actually being sent. Now, the tricky thing is for a transceiver, remember, there's no offer answer yet, potentially. So uh, in that situation, um, it, you know, particularly if you haven't called set coded preferences, it, 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 you know, if it's just one, then it can be any one of the codecs that's in set capabilities. Um, and again, it's a little bit weird, though, because, right, you, you haven't, uh, you know, haven't, if you call set coded preferences, you could actually try to make something at the head that's not in your air transceiver call. Uh, and there you'd have a bit of a contradiction. Um, so I, I, I think there may be, um, as Jan Ivar said, that it's possible there could be a little bit of conflict there. And I think we have to, we have to think this through in the PR um, to be exactly clear what happens in that uh, situation. Do you have any thoughts, Florent? I think, yes, we should check against uh, the capabilities if we don't have any codec preferences. And that's something that makes sense and that we do in other places, especially in the SVC spec. Um, I do believe that one of the main problem that I, when I talk about renegotiation, is when you renegotiate and a codec goes away, and what happens to all the, the entries that were using that codec? Right. Um, in the encodings and choosing a behavior uh, is what would uh, matter, which is why I mentioned maybe uh, set remote description should uh, for an error. Maybe we should offer more tools uh, to be able to inspect what is in um, uh, SDP to know which codecs are would be applied in a sender and to allow the application to reconfigure. Uh, their encoders before applying the description. Maybe there's uh, diff different ways to uh, approach this. Um, I guess we can uh, gather feedback in the issue as we uh, write a spec proposal uh, for this in more detail. But yeah, I think we are running out of time uh, for uh, this and we should probably uh, move on to the next uh, uh, slide and issue. Thank you. I think you got some feedback. Um, yes, that's it. Got your feedback. 
Let's Thank see you. what the proposal come up, comes up. All right. So this is somewhat related and also a bit different. So how to deal with encoder errors. Uh, so when you call set parameters, um, if you're doing something that's not supported, we, we know what to do because we can react the promise uh, and do nothing. But we don't know what to do if an encoder error happens later asynchronously, uh, either like a hardware uh, error that was previously mentioned, or, and this is how I'll tie it back later, but what about negotiation and so on. Anyway, if an error happens, right now the spec doesn't say uh, what, what should happen. Uh, and some issues with this is that an app may desire different codecs, uh, scalability modes, and number of active layers depending on which codec is used. So if you use, maybe you want to use VP8 simulcast, but you want to use, uh, you know, SVC for, for VP9, and then you're in a case where not even the active flag matches. So if, if the fallback logic switches codec, maybe the scalability mode doesn't work or maybe it does work but now you're sending simulcast when you intended to send uh, svc uh, so arguably because we have this combination of codec scalability mode and uh, number of layers i say there's no sensible default i mean you can have current defaults which always work but you'll end up sending more layers than, than you might have intended uh, the second problem is that the browser doesn't know uh, which preferences the app has. So why do we delegate this to the browser if the app knows how to deal with it? So arguably, APIs already exist for taking action. When an error happens, we can call set parameters with a different combination of uh, these things. Uh, what is missing is an error callback. Uh, and there's a, a, a precedence for this, a web codex error callback, uh, different API, but just an example. Uh, so next slide. There we go. Okay, so my proposal is that if an error occurs asynchronously, we inactivate all the layers and notify the app via a callback. And um, so that allows you to, in the uh, event listener, you can set parameters with the new uh, combination. And you can also do the same for decode errors. I think that would be very useful for hardware decode errors, uh, especially. And the bonus with this, in my opinion, is, is if we have a way to handle uh, fallbacks, then this would allow using set parameters before the first negotiation. And if the negotiation removes a codec, you would be able to handle fallback the same way. Uh, there might be some possible, you know, uh, you know, you might want to opt in to this fallback mechanism, such as is there an event listener? But uh, I've not gone into those kinds of details. All right, Bernard, you're in the queue. Yeah, so uh, my question is whether it's always active equal false on all layers, say for the mixed codec simulcast, it's the AB1 codec that ran on a resource. Uh, could you just keep sending H264? Do you really have to stop that one too, even though it wasn't the source of the error? Um, yeah, so uh, front brought to my attention uh, earlier today, actually, that you might want to know which layer the error happened on. Right, and right, right. On. So in this example, I just said DOM exception, but we might want to have encoder specific details and different things uh, in yeah. the callback. That's a good point. Okay. Thank you. John Iver? Oh yeah, so, so two comments. Uh, one you addressed, I think, when you said callback, this could be, I hope this means event. Uh, yes, event, sorry. Yeah. Uh, and the other one was, on your previous slide, you said that uh, the, the hassle, the downside here was that the browser might not know what to do in that situation and switch on the uh, to an inferior encoding. Uh, did I get that wrong? Uh, because this slide, it seems setting active default seems, uh, um, is that necessary? Why not just fire the error handler fallback and let the JavaScript um, interfere if it can? Uh, well, if if the current encoder 
doesn't work. You either have to like so you can't keep using it. You you either have to stop encoding altogether, or you'd need to switch to some default. And I was arguing that there's no sensible default if we allow uh, combinations of, of uh, codec scalability mode and active. Uh, but there might be a, a, a default that, that does make sense. My concern is if we have some default is that we send keyframes, uh, extra keyframes or do something uh, unexpected. I'm not sure if it's a, it's a big or a small problem though. Uh, so Yuan, do you want to go next? Sure, yeah. Um, so uh, I'm wondering what will be the definition of errors? Like uh, a user agent might think, hey, this is an error. And another user agent will say, oh, it's a transient error. I will be able to fix it, so I will not send the error. Like, like for instance, uh, if a process that uh, has the encoder or decoder is crashing, for instance, then you might think it's an error. But in fact, the process will be relaunched and the encoder will be reinstantiated and you will be able to recover very nicely. So I I'm wondering whether it's encode error, decode error, or whether it's more like, hey, something changed, like the um, setup that we, the parameters that we are actually using have changed. Uh, web application, are you fine with these new parameters and so on? And uh, if that's not that, then, um, yeah, the question would be how we can define properly errors in an interoperable way, and that might be difficult. That's a very good point. Um, I, I think that's true. Some errors you might want to just notify the app, but uh, it's not necessary for the app to act. For example, you fall back from hardware to software, or something happens that you can recover from. Um, and other errors might be like, so that I think that would be good to have a consensus on uh, in general, like should this only be encode decode errors or should this also include the fallback me mechanism for uh, codex being removed from uh, negotiation? Uh, open question. Harald, you're next. So uh, we shouldn't stop anything unless the uh, error forces us to sh stop and uh, so active falls on all layers when it it should only happen if the, if you're using actually using the crash encoder on all layers for instance and if the encoder is capable of go going on perhaps at a reduced rate well we shouldn't stop it from doing that we have had some, uh, one thing I think is that this should be an event because uh, events have defined behavior where you can say that, okay, if the, you can, you can have a def default action that happens after the event handler had, has executed and there's an API for, 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 uh, saying don't do that i'll handle it on myself so the normal return we could then have fire the event on everything that significantly changes the encoding and have the default return be oh let's the platform switch to something else and you can prevent the error and do something else instead so that's an excellent suggestion so I, I do like it to have an async event saying, hey, something wrong happened, decide. And if you don't decide, I'm just going to do my usual. So let's continue with this one. It's fun. Also Bernard? in the queue, Bernard. Yeah, uh, just one last point. I, I agree with both uh, UN and Harold here, but uh, I just want to make clear, I don't think this is for uh, recovery, right? Like if you were, um, if something was lost on the receiver, you're not, you're not, you're not uh, getting into the stream of PLIs or NACs or anything like that, right? This is just for real errors, not for, uh, just wanted to confirm that. 
Uh, yeah, real errors, but, uh, you know, the point is still valid that there might be fallbacks, uh, right, like hardware to software, stuff like that. Um, so right, I, I, so that would be like, that would be UN something changed. Yeah. Uh, if the if the error is recover even if if the error is recoverable, I would assume that you wouldn't throw this. You wouldn't have this event, um, as UN said. The the browser would just do what it does to bring it back, because it's just, yeah. particularly just, if if you're setting active false. I don't want to create more problems that wouldn't right. have to be there. Uh, as a side note, for instance, some uh, OSs are changing from hardware to software based on the resolution of the the stream. So it's not even an error, but still okay. something has changed. Right. Hardware switch to software. So maybe we should limit the scope of this to unrecoverable errors. Uh, right. Well, how about the? I, I do like the change. A, a change, like like you you failed over to software, but now you look at stats and this thing is, uh, you know, you, you discover that, it, that it's it's really performance is terrible now and not really acceptable here on a mobile device. You're draining the battery. So, so, so you, you were told that it was happening. So chair, chair interrupt. We're over time. So uh, please, uh, pl please uh, finish the argument and we'll drain the queue and then move on. But I think we should just finish it and get up. Anyway, thank you. Tim. So yeah, I, I I like this, but I think the name's wrong. I don't think it's an error. I think it's an um, I think it's a codec availability change. The point. The point. Okay, Move, moving on. We have. Oh, this this is what uh, people asked me to uh, present. To, to men mention. Uh, so, Philip and I got into an argument on how set off the RTP header extensions work. And, uh, well, I had one opinion. He had a different opinion. I'm uh, tentatively conclu concluding that he, he's right and I'm wrong. So I'm uh, willing. I'm, I'm willing to drop drop my drop my position unless unless the group uh, really objects to uh, objects to Philip's uh, proposal. Do you have a quick summary to to the group, or is it too difficult? And we should just read the issue. You should uh, read read the issue. Ba basically, I said I I originally specified language that says. Okay, here's here's the list of extensions I want to modify. Go modify them, and uh, everything else would be unchanged. Well, uh, Philip suggested that a much cleaner approach, and which is more compatible with uh, with uh, the way we deal with parameters, is that you should get a list of all the parameters, and then change the one you want once you want to change, and then and then you set parameters uh, or set off for the header extension or set offered RTP head extensions with a whole set. So, Jan uh, Iver. Yes, I, I basically agree with Philip here and that it's more web compatible um, because it forces JavaScript to deal with the negotiated, uh, um, deal with the pool of what the browser supports. Otherwise, uh, if they can pass in hard-coded values, uh, there might not be good fallbacks. I also opened an issue. I also got some thumbs up in what WG that uh, frozen arrays of dictionaries is probably a bad idea, which would impact header extensions to offer. Yeah. If people want to look at that. Yeah. Good point. Yuan, last words on the subject. Uh, yeah, from what you're saying, I agree also that we should go with Philip's approach. Okay. We have we have a, we we seem to have a clear sense of direction. We'll go on. And now we're just uh, five minutes over time. Oh, it's me. So Bernard, you have the chair job of stopping me in time. Okay. I still I still have the slides, so I'll just keep clicking. So you see some of this slide where before. Some of this new. Uh, 
going beyond the bump in the stack and then call the media manipulation. There's several interesting use cases. So uh, we've uh, seen them in SPRs on uh, WebRTC and the use cases. Uh, you might argue about which, which are impo more important than others, but there are some. And uh, I have a PR for explaining how I think this should work on a coded media, which has had some comment, especially from UN. Anyway, so the use cases we added are live encoded media, for instance, non-WebRTC non cameras that do, do encoding, and where the data enters the browser through other means than WebRTC. There's uh, use cases for transmitting stored encoded media, for example, music and hold. There are details in the in the the merged uh, PRs on this one uh, on all of this, and there's decoding pre-encoded media that is using WebRTC to using the decoder component of WebRTC so that uh, you can take things coming in from an over a data channel or web transport or whatever and still fit it within the framework of the of the WebRTC based application without significant structural modification. Uh, that turned into requirements. Uh, we should be able to create senders without encoders and receivers without decoders. We should be able to create frames and queue frames, both upstream and downstream. And we should be able to handle control signals like uh, request keyframe or your bandwidth is now something. And uh, you should be able to modify frame metadata because a frame that comes in from one direction is not necessarily the right frame to send in the other direction. And you might have to change sequence numbers, timestamps, dependency descriptors, because uh, the other transport or decoder or whatever was expecting a particular number as the next number. So I did an API design that was uh, for frame handling, which is basically create frame from a metadata and a data, modifying a frame because uh, sometimes you just need to modify the metadata. You don't need to touch the data and especially don't need to copy it. And following the same pattern as we discussed just yesterday, get metadata, modify, and set metadata, metadata. Data modification happens uh, asynchronously with uh, with uh, metadata modification, which is uh, raises an open question, really. When do we check if data and metadata are consistent with each other? If I encrypted the data and the metadata, metadata says that it has a, has a, a TDX error, well, who cares? Or who checks? So I think our APIs so far have been reasonably successful in using streams for handling frames. But uh, reconfiguration requests or like uh, change bitrate or send keyframe are more event-like. You don't expect them on a regular cadence. You don't expect a stream of them. You expect something to happen. So let's uh, use an event-like mechanism for them. 
So my proposal at the moment is the say is the one I put together for IETF hackathon in November. Make an interface. It's got a readable stream. It's got a function for requesting a keyframe, function for requesting a bandwidth, possibly a function for requesting a resolution. And say that you can offer this interface from either a platform object or a JavaScript object. And so that, for instance, on the sender, you could have a call that says, hey, now I want to handle the frames. You can not. And uh, then have a function that says, okay, you take frames from this stream, and I'll give it to you. So my diddling around at the hackathon said that uh, we don't need anything more than this, really. So comparing this with other models that we have tried, the, the model that Chrome uses for stream creation, well, source is easy to, easy to emulate. This, uh, this uh, thing doesn't expose the sync. We could probably adapt that one too. And signals, OK, now they're, in the current model, they're handle, handling be, being handled implicitly. But uh, relaying a signal is easy. And the Apple model that is currently in the spec, the main difference is that there's no required interaction with workers, which allows us to use transferable streams to get to a worker. Or there might be other sensible mechanisms. One thing I want to do long term is to redefine the RTP sender and RTP receiver objects as boxes that contain other boxes. So an RTP sender should be an RTP encoder plus an RTP packetizer. And having the packetizer insert the frames from the encoder. And similarly, a, a receiver is a depacketizer plus, the, plus a decoder using the interface from the previous slides between them. And if done right, these components should have clear enough interfaces and roles that is possible to specify them and use them really independently and still be compatible with the current model. So working in this group decisions we need, we need to agree that these use cases is within scope. That means more CFCs. And uh, agree to accept proposals for APIs that support these use cases requirements, such as the one I just sketched. We're not at the, at the point yet where we can say, uh, oh, this interface works. This interface uh, is uh, the wrong one, I think. We got to see, got to see. Okay, what's the what's the proposal we need? These are proposals. Okay, now we're at discussion. I think so. Floor is open. Starting with Bernard. Uh, I have uh, two questions. One is about whether uh, you can whether there's an assumption that the packetizer is one of the ones that's already in the browser, or whether uh, you could do packetization yourself. The use case would be. Uh, say HEBC, which is supported in Web Codex, if you have the hardware, uh, but it's not supported in WebRTC. So could, could you make that work? You know, by getting uh, frames out of Web Codex or encode or decode out of Web Codex and then doing it. That's question one. Uh, um, anyway, uh, I have another question, but why don't you answer that one first? Yeah. So, the, so my thinking about packetizers is that pack, uh, the, the number of behaviors in packetizers are is sharply limited. So we should really be willing to tell the packetizer that uh, that uh, you need to behave according to A, B, C, D, A, E. 
I don't have a proposal that says bring your own packetizer yet. You could make one. And, but uh, I did raise an issue on the WebRTC and Code Transform earlier today, where I talked about interaction with SDP, which I didn't I didn't get as far as to cover this in Schleidware on this meeting. We'll have to discuss that on a, on a later meeting. But, but with respect to the use case, do you, I mean, it, it's not discussed in the use case. So uh, anyway, that, that's a question about the use case, whether it should include some, you know, define what the required packetization functionality is. Yep. Uh, my second question is about workers. So like if you're doing something like web codecs, you're often doing the encode decode in a worker. So I'm just wondering the, about the uh, required functionality for interacting with workers. Um, because it does this does this implicitly require have being able to do a RTP sender or receiver in a worker? I am very unsure about that actually. Okay. Because uh, the model uh, of the of the API is suggested gives you a, a a stream, and the stream can be transferred, and the stream has uh, then after that no interaction with the main thread. If we get the issues there solved, at least. Uh, but uh, the events are not transferred. We might want to have transferable objects, transferable uh, transferability of objects that implement this interface. But I'm not sure either how to specify that or how easy it is to implement that. Our implementation of uh, of uh, of transferable tracks turned out to be far more difficult than uh, we had anticipated when we started. I'm uh, a bit scared of uh, ending up in the, having the same problem with transferability of uh, interface objects. But let's hear more people, I think. Peter. Can you go back a slide? Sure. OK, so um, you're asking if we think these use cases are in scope and if we uh, are willing to accept proposals, right? Yes. OK, so my answer would be yes on both of those for myself. Um, but I'd like to know, similar to Bernard's question, if that scope and the proposals can include ones that do allow for custom packetization. In particular, I'm interested in applications being able to do custom FEC, which I believe does require some kind of packet level control. Yeah, um, good question. And I think that uh, none of the use cases we have, I have on my list are requiring custom packetization. But I think there are use cases for custom packetization, but uh, we need to add them. And if we manage to separate out the packetizer as a component with a defined upstream interface, then in quote, quote marks all that is needed is to define an, a downstream interface for it. But uh, I've always, I've, I've been hesitant in the past to go into exposing packet level to JavaScript. Uh, and I'm still somewhat nervous and somewhat uh, uh, hesitant to go, to go down that route if all our use cases that we currently have described are satisfiable on the, on the higher level. On the on the frame level, Yanni, what? Uh, just a just a point, Harold. Uh, we're now at time, and I want to make sure that we know what the next steps are on this issue. Are we to run a CFC uh, CFC on the use cases? Um, exactly, what do you want to have happen? So I think we should run a CFC on the use cases, and I'm happy to go on this and uh, to uh, and if we're agree that uh, there's uh, no objection to, to to making proposals, then I'll just go on and make proposals. 
and then we can discuss the, discuss those. So CFCs on use cases is one, definitely one of the things I want, yes. And, and that can start fairly immediately? Yep. Okay. I think so. So then, Yanni, Yanni, we have to drain the queue. Yanni, what? Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, I don't have a problem with COVID consensus. Um, there's a lot uh, on the use cases uh, to go through. It'd be nice to get a little more specificity on them, I think, and why things like that. So, but in general, I worry that uh, we run the risk of creating too many APIs that do similar things. Um, Firefox is committed to implementing, we're currently implementing the, um, what you call the Apple, uh, the spec model using stream. And also, we are, WebRTC samples already has relaying examples uh, where you can just take a media stream track from one peer connection and stuff it in the other. Nothing prevents implementations, as far as I know, from uh, skipping decode encode in those cases and optimizing them. Um, but you do mention the abilities to modify frame metadata and other controls, which become more important, I think, to highlight uh, the need for new APIs there. Um, but other than that, what was my point? <clears throat> oh yeah, with streams, I would say uh, this. Even though uh, one might argue the streams API wasn't necessarily perhaps the best API for our use of it in web emergency encoded streams, at the end of the day, JavaScript is going to plug in a transform stream, which are basically going to be callbacks called by the browser on JavaScript. So I don't see any problem there. I don't see an inherent problem with JavaScript writing code that is timing as timing sensitive as you would be able to achieve with events. That's my comment. Thanks. Yuan? Yeah, I think the Bernard and Peter's question about uh, packet or frame is a question I asked also uh, several times. And I think we should uh, concentrate the debate there. And if uh, if we see that we, we actually want a packet level API, we should uh, try to figure out the security issues and, and the model. And it will be probably very different uh, than if we stay at the frame level. So that's why I, I do not want to spend a lot of time on uh, digging to a frame API if at the end of the day we decide we want a packet API. Yeah. So uh, my, my current take is that I haven't yet seen the use case that uh, that uh, I haven't yet seen the use case written up that warrants uh, uh, a packet level API. So I'm very happy to uh, see the use case, discuss the use case, and then decide upon the use case. Uh, but uh, at the moment, what I want to do is is possible to do at the frame level, which uh, which mean, which is uh, for me a reason that a reason for per pursuing the frame level API. So, let's see the use cases. And we have some mentioned. And Peter, that's a, that's a headline, not the not a, not the write up. Please supply the body. Um, so, concretely, should we wait for the CFC until we see this additional alternate use cases, or do we think the use cases are valid to review in isolation? I think the use cases are valid to review, and uh, it's possible, and uh, it's an open discussion on whether those can be satisfied with uh, a, pa a packet and a packet level only API. I think some of them are not consistent with a with a packet level api in particular the three last ones yeah as we've seen people can review use cases and criticize the requirements there we're, we're good at that <laughs> yeah let's do that okay see if this so as, as bernard said we're over time so Shall I start? Elad. Thank you. So, hello, I'm Elad, and I'm going to talk about the new screen capture community group that we're forming. Next slide, please. 
Thank you. So um, over the last years, uh, we've discussed many topics related to screen capture in this working group. It's been uh, very interesting and we've made uh, significant progress. Uh, but one thing that we've been kind of missing is significant participation from web developers. And I think that one of several reasons here is that screen capture is distinct from WebRTC. When you capture the current screen, a, a screen, a window or a tab, you can do many things with it. One of those is to transmit it remotely, and you could even transmit it remotely using WebRTC. But maybe using some other means, or maybe you do something else with the stream, such as just saving it to disk. Or maybe you do something interesting before or after transmitting it. And all of those are topics which are not truly connected to WebRTC. And the developers that are interested in that are not necessarily also interested in WebRTC and vice versa. And I think that in order to increase developer participation in uh, matters related to screen capture, it would be good if we have a screen capture community group. And I've reached out to a couple of such developers and they seem to think similarly and several of them have joined the group. So we intend to discuss such topics as better integration of capturing and captured applications, element capture, recording all screens, and your own topics too. So you're all very cordially invited. And uh, I would love to see you there. Next slide, please. So please join us. Um, any questions? And I guess not. So uh, thank you very much. Next slide, please. So um, in quick succession, I would like to discuss the fact that we've got one spec called capture handle identity, which is somewhat tied to a uh, capture handle actions spec. And I think that at least for uh, capture handle identity, uh, this group should probably hand it over to the, to the screen capture community group. And I would like to uh, lay out my case here. So just a quick reminder for everybody, Capture Handle Identity is a uh, discusses a mechanism that allows would-be captured apps to self-declare declare an identity to the capture and hopefully one day also additional information. This API has been uh, implemented in Chromium and shipped, and it's been gainfully employed by all sorts of web applications. For example, Meet and uh, Google Meet and Google Slides use that. And um, yeah, uh, we're, we've got plans of uh, extending it even elsewhere uh, in Google. So I've proposed multiple extensions to this spec, but we seem to be uh, misaligned on the vision here. Uh, we being me and I believe any or that you've got uh, a different vision and therefore you've got a different spec called capture handle actions. And also we seem to be um, at somewhat of a disagreement on several of the extensions I have proposed uh, for example, exposing uh, crop targets on the capture handle. So I think that at this point, it would be good if each uh, party uh, took its own spec and ran with it, extended it until the point where it becomes uh, a fully fleshed uh, proposal. And then we can propose these different specs, to different groups, and a group can make a decision of either adopting one of those. Uh, next slide, please or maybe even synthesizing both of them together. Um, and I think that we will enjoy better iteration speed if we do that, if we first split them and uh, then come back later. So that's my proposal. Uh, next slide. And I give up the mic to everybody who wants to grab it. Um, sorry, I, I missed a couple of uh, um, a couple of meetings because I was on the parental leave. Um, do I need to say an Ivor, please, or does one of the chairs do that? Uh, Harold, you're muted. I can say that. Yeah, Ivor. Uh, yes, thank you. So, um, uh, on the earlier slide, I, I do think that. When you say where well, the screen capture is part of WebRTC, <clears throat> I think traditionally WebRTC working group has been in charge of every API that produces or consumes the media stream track. 
other than the HTML video capture spec. So I think there's good history there. We have tried to give away media capture to another W3C working group, but none has uh, wanted to. Um, I don't think it will be progress to uh, move specs, moving specs from uh, web W3C groups uh, to uh, working groups to community groups seems like a step backwards. It's been uh, less than a year since we adopted uh, this this spec. <clears throat> um, when you said the action spec was my spec, and it was uh, it, so the action spec <clears throat> is not instead of the identity spec, but it's a, it's a supplement that addresses uh, a, a subset of use cases. So <clears throat> I think historically, uh, the way we uh, what's the term? When we consider uh, what's the slide here? Could you go back a slide, please? <clears throat> I could go back another slide. <clears throat> uh, one more. Thank you. De adopting. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, I think traditionally, when we talk about de adopting a spec, it's because uh, members either have no interest in it or uh, they do not want to implement it at all. And I think for Mozilla, at least, we are definitely interested in this, uh, which we showed when we adopted the spec uh, a year ago. So we have no change in opinion on this. We think this is a valuable API that should be developed. So we would be opposed to the adopting it. Um, Bernard? Yeah, um, so uh, procedurally, I just wanted to uh, clarify what uh, will happen here. Uh, are you proposing a CFC on just the adopting capture handle? Is that the scope of the CFC? So uh, procedurally, um, <clears throat> it's up for uh, the group to decide how this would best be done. But what I uh, would eventually want to happen is uh, for a version of capture handle identity to be uh, incubated by me and whoever else wants to uh, participate and eventually proposed. And I think that the place to incubate it now would be the SCCG, so the Screen Capture Community Group. And if that means that uh, this is the adopted by the current group and given to the SCCG, or if it means that the SCCG creates a copy of the document, um, I think any war, any uh, version of this works for me, but we should probably choose the one that works best for everyone. Okay, so uh, a CFC in the Web RTC working group about the adoption, but uh, just to be clear, there's no uh, this does not include the adoption of any other screen capture proposal, right? So that still remains in the Web RTC working group. Just trying to understand the boundaries between the the community group and the, and this one. Yes, uh, the current proposal is only for capture handle identity to move to that group. Uh, Bernard, do you do you want to say anything more? You're muted, or do we uh, no? Here? I just I think that makes it clear. Thank you. Okay, but of course I'm open. Like if you think that more documents need to move alongside it, I'm not going to say no. You want? I cannot hear you, you and I think nobody else can. You're muted, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I don't think the um, WebRT, uh, anybody from uh, needs the WebRT working group uh, approval to uh, fork a spec, update it, do whatever they want with it. And the community group, I think, is uh, fully able to, to do that without us doing anything. I think it, it happened. Uh, uh, in in the past, there, there would be extensions elsewhere, or there would be V2 elsewhere, and at some point it would be brought back to the WRC working group. So that, that's probably is what I would tend to, to do. I, I do not see what brings to the table the fact of a spec that was in WebRC working group and would move away from the WebRC working group. Yeah, the other. Uh, just uh, there was a characterization of disagreement earlier. I would just like to add that, in my view, all the disagreements are minor and usually over API 
um, differences. Uh, the, there's general agreement on on all the main uh, use cases and desired behaviors. Thanks. And Dom? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, it is uh, factually correct that the community group could decide to fork the spec and do whatever is it, it, it wants with it. Uh, I do think that this creates uncertainty and fragmentation in terms of what is being implemented, discussed, uh, and it makes building a consensus view harder. Um, I mean, my, my personal inclination would be to bite the bullet and, and indeed uh, figure out how to solve these disagreements, which uh, I kind of agree with Yaniva, uh, I think uh, on the API shape, not on the purpose or overall direction. Uh, but if that's no longer realistic, then uh, I think I would prefer a cleaner break than uh, an ambiguous situation where we would have a spec in the working group that nobody really invests in and a spec in a CG where one implementer is putting all of its effort that, that feels like uh, a disservice to the community. I'm going to invite myself to speak next. Um, I'm putting down the hand. Uh, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> so um, I think that the disagreements about the shape are a bit bigger than character uh, than uh, you have characterized, Yanivar. I think that uh, it is a bit difficult to uh, make forward progress right now. And um, I think that um, given that the major contributor to one of the specs is uh, interested in forking it and starting it uh, and continuing elsewhere, I don't really see who would benefit of leaving the original in the work in the current working group. So I think we're out of time, uh, but we understand the next step, which I guess would be a CFC on the adoption, if I get that correctly for the minutes. OK, so uh, will the chairs take uh, the AI to uh, do that? That's my assumption, unless there's, uh, yeah, going forward for the minutes, we'll, we'll start a CFC on that. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much. I think I, uh, I'm also presenting next. So, so uh, a couple of slides forward, please. Um, thank you very much. So next topic, autopause of capture or stopping the name of love before you break my heart. Next slide, please. So a quick reminder, um, when you capture a surface, uh, that surface can change at any moment. There are two main ways this can happen, maybe three. Uh, first, either the user or the captured application could navigate the top level document, in which case you suddenly you start capturing a.com, suddenly you're capturing b.com, maybe the user intended that, maybe they made a mistake, maybe the application actually caused that. Another option is that the user could choose to start capturing something else. With Chrome, that would be using share this tab instead, a button that you can see on the bottom left. And with Safari, that could be with changing between shared windows and screen, which is a recently uh, recently released uh, functionality and uh, very well done there. Next slide, please. So this can be problematic because applications might want to tailor certain actions uh, to what they're capturing. So for example, maybe if you go from a.com to b.com, you want to prompt the user to make sure that they really wanted to do that. Maybe uh, if you're capturing different things, you want to uh, crop to different sub-targets of those, uh, of those uh, surfaces. Maybe you want to apply different constraints, like maybe you want a different resolution frame rate if you're capturing a window versus a screen. Uh, maybe you want to change the encoding parameters. Maybe you want to save that to different files. So each time you capture something else, it's in a different file. You could come up with other examples. And when that happens, you kind of need two things. You need an event to happen, letting you know that, hey, something changed. And you also want to kind of have the time to change whatever you want to change before more frames are produced and potentially immediately put, placed on the wire. Next slide, please. 
Uh, Bernard, if you can do that, I think Harald did the, if, okay, Harald is here. Thank you. So here's one proposal. Um, initially, if we could uh, focus on the bigger picture, I know that maybe there are a lot of uh, edge cases here. Yes, you're in. Uh, you and you've raised a hand. Do you want to go down or do you want to be first later? Uh, yeah, continue. I'll ask my question later. Sure. Uh, but just a uh, way. Um, spoiler alert, I'm going to talk about your recent uh, on device change or something like that. Not device change, on configuration change. So uh, I'm going to touch on that too. So assume uh, for the sake of argument that we had one more concept, right? Pause. I assume this is still for later. Uh, and same slide, please. Uh, previous slide, please. I, um, uh, previous slide, please. Uh, I'm sorry, could we go down to 49? I think that we're in 51 right now. Yeah. And thank you. And 50, please. Sorry. So which do you want? Uh, it looks like I want 50. I'm sorry. It just changed while I was not looking. And thank you very much. So. Currently, there are two uh, concepts. There is muted, which means that the track is not producing frames, but this is outside of the control of the application. It's not something that the application uh, uh, initiated, and it can also not stop it. So for example, maybe the user has minimized a window, and you are not uh, producing uh, frames for minimized windows. Uh, the application cannot initiate that, and it cannot make the window unminimized. Another concept we have is enabled, where the application can you know, pause and unpause by setting enabled false or enabled true. So I suggest that we introduce one more concept of paused, where the action was initiated not by the application, but the application can unpause. And here's how it works. Next slide, please. So first, we create an enum where we say the pause reason. The pause reason can be that the user or the application navigated the top level document that is being captured. Another one is that maybe a surface switch occurred. So the user chose to capture a different window. And spoiler alert, maybe a config change. And we take this event and we expose an event handler for it on the track. So, and if somebody sets that event handler, then whenever something like this happens, the track is going to get auto paused. An event is going to be fired, and then the application could, if it wants to, unpause from that event on for, or from a later point. Next slide, please. Thank you. So here is a generic example where basically you say, hey, track, on pause uh, event handler, and whenever there you get auto paused, you check, hey, do I need to adjust something? If not, just unpause the, the track, or if I need to adjust something, I can adjust it. Maybe I prompt the user. Maybe I apply a different crop target. Maybe I you know, change the encoding, et cetera. And then I unpause. And that's it. Uh, you plug in your own implementation of adjustment necessary and adjust, which are just for illustration purposes here. And you get your own behavior that handles this. Next slide, please. So uh, I would like to get back to this uh, later, but obviously, uh, we want to somehow get the default behavior that if you don't set an, an event handler, you just get automatically unpaused. And that means that everything is backwards compatible. Existing uh, applications don't need to change anything. Uh, we can get back to that later if relevant. Next slide, please. So the last thing I want to uh, say is that um, there is a similar use case in the recently introduced on configuration change where basically you get an event whenever something changes. And I would like to ask, maybe what you want to do when configuration changes is to get the event, but also to pause the track until you decide if you actually want to continue receiving frames given the uh, new configuration. Next slide, please. And uh, I think that UN goes first. Yeah, so I think the use case makes sense. Uh, and it seems good to solve the issue. Uh, I don't think the API shape is uh, at the right level. It's probably at the level of the source because you, you, you don't want one track to continue uh, being working while another is not working. So it's probably at Capture Controller that you actually want to have this kind of, hey, something has changed, do something, and then it could be async like uh, 
respond within fetch event or as Harold mentioned uh, uh, for another uh, encoder thing and we we could reuse that pattern so that we, there would be only one event in the capture controller instead of as many events as a uh, clone track for instance but um yeah let, let's let's try to dive into the api shape if everybody agrees with uh solving the issue i think next uh, thank you very much uh so yaniver you kind of left the queue and re-entered it uh, who goes next? You or team? What's the gentleman's agreement? Um, well, either way. <laughs> yeah, let's go with Tim. Is that the top of the queue? Right. Um, yeah. So, uh, does this cover um, audio as well? So, you, your list of potential um, reasons for pausing seem kind of fairly video orientated. Uh, is is it? Would it cover audio? Um, as well. Um, <clears throat> that's an interesting question. I think that um, it could also be a distinguishing factor for uh, UN's uh, suggestion of putting it on the capture controller instead. Uh, by the way, I've also been uh, talking with Ben recently, and maybe uh, maybe a source object is actually also appropriate. Uh, but in either case, um, I think it's possible that you would want to pause one but not the other. I think that it's much easier to kind of um, have a glitchless exam, um, glitchless operation with video where the user does not notice as readily when one frame is a bit late than with audio. Um, but I'm open to discussing this more. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm thinking of the case where um, you know you get the incoming GSM call and and you suddenly lose you lose your your input source. Um, you know, you, get, you lose your you lose your microphone source, and if that that came up as a paused event, and you could then substitute kind of music on hold or something that you were sending, then that would like uh, that might be a use case that would be worth adding to this if we don't have another way of solving that problem. Um, for this particular example, uh, it could be that I've not thought about it enough yet, but it sounds like the muted event is sufficient because you could get the muted event and then just unplug your track from wherever it's going right now and then when you get the uh, unmute event if you decide that you need to make the you know a renewed decision you can but i could be mistaken here um i don't know if this is critical to discuss uh, right now given the queue i mean yeah so so just let's flag up the audio abuse cases try and add them if they're relevant agreed So then I can speak up and uh, I think this use case is definitely worth solving. Uh, traditionally, we haven't exposed source on uh, to JavaScript, which is my worry every time we talk about source. Uh, we, we might uh, want we might want to. Um, and we might want to define that, that the capture controller is a source, just like a uh, video check generator. Maybe. Uh, but uh, definitely worth solving. I want, I, I'd like to mention again that we have this thing in the event interface called prevent default. That says so that you can say when the event handler returns, something's going to happen until unless I say no. Which kind of kind of works pretty neatly with this particular use case. So, go for it. I I like it. But let let's continue to discuss. That's me. Uh, thank you, Yanivar. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I initially took down my hand because I thought UN covered it. I agree with UN that uh, this probably belongs on the capture controller, which I think to a single capture is indistinguishable from a source. <clears throat> Not for multiple captures, of course, but that seems fine. Uh, I'm a bit worried about, <clears throat> again, similar like we had earlier with active false, is that it sounds like the browser, it seems to me we shouldn't terminate output uh, because that puts out new roadblocks for JavaScript that they have to, you know, events should be optional, I think, as much as possible. So it seems odd here that if old JavaScript doesn't do anything, then the capture is going to stop. That seems undesirable. 
So I would love to have a different shape that where the default isn't the terminate output. I don't see a, a reason for that. <clears throat> but also, uh, the name media stream tracks are also used for many things other than screen capture. So I think that would be a reason. And if that's moved to screen capture controller, I think that resolves that issue. But if it's not, then uh, I have other issues uh, like in media capture extensions, issues 39. We've talked about um, fixing the double mute problem and other things. So I worry that having both muted, unmuted, and paused can be confusing. That's my feedback. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> sorry, uh, the audio was not fully clear on my end, so uh, I might have missed a, a bit of this. Um, so with respect to uh, putting this on the capture uh, controller, um, it makes some initial sense. Uh, one thing to worry about is that uh, whereas the track itself is uh, transferable and could even be transferred to a different tab, um, the capture controller is not transferable and that is by design. And um, so that kind of worries me in, it's gonna be kind of difficult for, you know, uh, to use that, after, to use a track after it's moved. Um, but maybe uh, it remains to be seen if that's a major concern. Um, with respect to um, uh, default action, I could have misunderstood you here, but what I think a core component of the proposal is that if an event handler is not set, things do not get auto paused. So the legacy behavior of if the user changes something, the application does not keeps on getting frames, uh, that is not going to change with this proposal and also with any other proposal I intend to uh, bring up. Uh, Yanivar, does that answer at least one of your concerns? Uh, yes, although I would caution, it sounded like you just said that you had difference in behavior based on whether an event handler is set or not, and that is not um, a suggested design. Thank you very much. If you could go back two slides. So the third bullet point here says that uh, there is a guidance for event handlers to not have side effects. And one way to get around that is to use uh, some kind of function like set pause handlers. And I think there is a precedent in the form of set action handler. Um, I would have to uh, check that again, but there is some precedent about doing that. Also, uh, Harold has mentioned something that I did not fully understand, but I intend to eventually research about prevent default. Uh, Harold? Uh, you're being, you're yeah, if the, the function of prevent default is used in a couple of other APIs, that it came as a surprise to me to learn about it. So that uh, you specify that there is a default action that is carried out uh, if the event does not prevent it. And uh, then and then you have the function called a function that is literally called prevent default that you fire at the event to say carry your message back to your master saying saying don't do, don't do the default thing and this would seem to suit the use case perfectly. I'm sold. So I guess the uh, next actions here would be um, to analyze whether this could be done on the capture controller or uh, on the track or alternatively on a source object and maybe present those in the next meeting. Uh, does that sound reasonable? Sounds good to me. Awesome. Um, I think that we're behind schedule anyway. So Henrik, uh, sorry for taking some of your time. No problem, and thank you. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a, an old issue. We discussed it a few months ago. I'm bringing it up again because the, the PR has been going a bit back and forth, uh, flip-flopping, uh, and I think it would be easier to, to talk about it and get like um, how it should be written uh, is what I want to achieve by bringing it up again. So the, the, the whole problem, just for, for context, is you know if, if your frame rate is low, 
uh, it's it's hard to know why it's it's low. Is it the camera not producing frames, or is the user agent dropping frames? And if they're dropped, are they dropped, you know, for performance reason, reasons, or because they're decimated in order to achieve the, the desired frame rate uh, of the settings? Uh, and so the the I think the reason the PR has been slow, other than me being slow, is that there's a balancing act between needing to be specific enough that we all agree on what we measure, but also be vague enough to allow different implementations. And, and as mentioned a minute ago, the source is not really exposed. So we're kind of trying to measure uh, something that's not really JS observable, like the counter of frames passing through basically. Uh, so my proposal, uh, which is also one of the comments is to not to, to use, phrase it as requirements rather than specific steps. Uh, video playback quality is an example of this. And I think that the way to achieve a good balancing act here is to uh, require uh, that each frame is categorized uh, in one of three distinct categories, because then you can say that the, you know, get frame stats, latest name, will just be a counter of the number of frames in that category. So next slide. Here's the categories I came up with. I also updated the PR to say that this is uh, only supported on, on tracks that supports the frame rate uh, as a setting. Uh, and each frame would be characterized as either being considered deliverable or delivered if it you know, either was delivered to a sync or it would have been delivered to a sync if one was connected. Uh, or it's decimated if it was discarded in order to achieve the frame rate settings. Uh, that's the target. Uh, and otherwise, it was dropped for, for any other reasons. Uh, main example being the system is under heavy load, then it's categorized as dropped. So get frame stats would just return this dictionary frames delivered, decimated, dropped based on the number of frames that have been categorized into each category. Does that make sense to people? <laughs> Yes, Tim. Yeah, I, I have two questions. Well, uh, I, I'm uncomfortable with decimated. It has a kind of fairly specific meaning, which I don't think you mean here. Um, like it's a factor of 10. So uh, that's kind of probably not what you had in mind. Um, and the, my other question is, like, what are we expecting the developer to do with this? I mean, I, I like the idea of describing it as like kind of at a higher level and rather than digging down too deep into the the mechanics but even further back what are we thinking the developer will do with this information you can measure uh you can make measure deltas between the camera settings and what you're actually achieving uh if you want to if you want to experiment with uh like performance experiments i think you want to be able to know uh, if you're dropping frames or not uh, unnecessarily. You might want to reconfigure the camera. Uh, it, it's also useful for uh, debugging. Uh, basically, uh, it, when when there's bug bugs that that the your, your frames are being dropped, uh, I think it would be good to know if if uh, if this is you know camera issue or uh, other issue. So, for example, you could, if it's a if it's a drop issue, you might want to uh, reconfigure. If it's a camera issue, you might want to show a pop up to the user. I'm sort of thinking aloud, but uh, all of this stems from seeing frame drops in the wild and not knowing uh, where they come from. Okay, so so it's a diagnostic issue, possibly more than like a. Um... A control surface feedback mainly surface. yes okay uh john Ivar? oh uh, yes thank you so um what would happen if i mute the track if i said track enabled false uh if you mute the track uh <laughs> yeah that's the something we might want to uh uh want to decide like e either you could just say everything's decimated or you would just 
not increment any of the counters. And I think it would probably make more sense to not increment any counters. Because at that point, it seems like a implementation detail. Yuan? Yeah, I, I was wondering whether, uh, I understand frames delivered and frames decimated. I was wondering whether the total number of frames that have been generated by the camera is the sum of all of them. Yes. And, and if so, maybe we should have frames delivered, frames decimated, and uh, frames generated instead of frames dropped. That, that works for me. I have no strong opinion about that. So, yes, Janiver? Oh, sorry. So, in a low light condition, um, and its setting is 30 frames per second, and the camera is only producing, say, 15 frames for that reason, it would say frames delivered 15 and frames dropped 15? And frames no. And zero. No, a frame that was never generated is not dropped. So uh, if we replace frames dropped with frames total, uh, like Joanne just uh, suggested, then then the total would be uh, 15 and the delivered would be 15. OK. Yeah, that seems simpler. Thanks. So are you, uh, is the, I get the sense that there's there's less pushback with uh, the approach of, of using these categories, but that input is that it makes, perhaps I want to rename decimated to something else and, and we should re replace frames dropped to total frames, but the overall approach, does that, does that make sense to people? I get thumbs up from Harald. Thumbs up from Yuen. And no one else has a camera. All right, uh, it sounds like we can make progress if I update the PR. Uh, thank you very much. Nice. All right, good. Then I'm done with my slides. And now do you want to take the summing up? Yes. Uh, so uh, why don't we move to the sum up slide? Uh, okay, so I think we have a number of uh, action items uh, that we need to go ahead with. One is uh, CFC on Harold's use cases. So we can initiate that immediately. And I think the second CFC is uh, from a lot uh, for the de-adoption of capture handle. Are there any other uh, action items that we haven't should put in the minutes? That's one sign of a lot. Um, could I request an action item from those interested to uh, um, chime in on uh, issue, I think, 255 um, regarding auto capture, uh, auto pause? It would be nice uh, before I give my next iteration of a proposal to get maybe a more concrete proposal of what it would look like if it were exposed on the capture controller instead. I would think just an event, basically, and then you can respond to it. Um, what about, so the question is whether we want to separate audio and video in that case, because I think that autopause in audio could be a bit more problematic. Then again, if you are changing surfaces, then maybe a glitch would not be noticed because these are different audio sources anyway. Um, it's an open question here. Um, I guess we start with something that pauses video and audio at the same time. Okay. Sure, in that case, I guess uh, the action item can be on me to uh, uh, flesh out two different proposals and to uh, bring them up to the group to decide between. Or maybe just one. <laughs> uh, if I am convinced uh, of the merits of the capture controller approach, of course. Okay, is there anything else? Any other action items or, or next steps in the working group? Okay, uh, why don't you go to the next slide, Hal? Because I think it's the first time in a while that we've actually gotten through and the one after that. Yeah, so we have a butterfly. That's what we get for actually finishing things on time. 
Uh, anybody have any idea what kind of butterfly this is? I will just tell you it's from South America. It is a of the Morphus. Yes, a blue Morpho. Mike English, you are correct. <laughs> How do you know that, by the way? Good job, man. Uh, yeah, that's exactly what it is. <laughs> Dom says he knew that too. Cool. Anyway, thank we you, everybody. Uh, properties. Okay, thank you all. Okay. See uh, you you had some help from AI. That's cheating, Mike. <laughs> anyway, they are cute. Okay. Okay. Bye, See everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.